So yeah, I think as last time we just did 2k, and I was kind of struggling with that Desmo Sedici. We're gonna do some Mon Nero. If we have anything. Uh time attack. Oh damn man. Ah, how come I got so many missing? Like it's a lot. For what, like two Oh, it's because of this one, isn't it? That was bronze. <sighs> Yeah, it's probably that. Should we redo it? So I don't. I really don't want to do the time attack. And that's the multi strata. We'll try the multi strata again. Off screen, I actually managed to drive it okay. So you know, it's the only touring bike, and I, I don't know how to. Ugh. So. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I've got this weird game I've invented over the years of travel where I move around a lot so obviously the currency changes and I have a lot of change but it's like that level of change where you're like, I can't exchange this, I'll get like 2p back. Pointless. So um, what I do is this thing where I collect all the change I have after like a year, two year period at each place and I just go to the local convenience store and try and buy stuff that like, it's like a maths game, I guess, although I suck at arithmetic, um, to try and get like the most value out of the, uh, it's taking a long time to load, out of the stuff. So if I've got like, I don't know, like 8.5 RMB, I'll try and find stuff like, you know, equates to that collectively or a single item preferably. See, it just went over itself. It's got a big turning circle. This. The cat's killing things again. He does that cat thing. He never used to do the cat thing, but if you put anything on the side and he can knock it off, he will knock it off. It's like, <laughs> I knocked it down. Ooh. Well, poop. Yeah, so I do that to just try and, like, get rid of any spare change and minimize loss. Because it annoys me. I don't like carrying Like, I've got, like, Five Macanese Patakas, Patakas, I don't know. Uh, like a couple of Hong Kong dollars, some like about 400 Thai baht in coins, uh, a bunch of euro from my trip to like, I don't know, Belgium or something uh, last. And uh, I think I got rid of all of them, but I might still have some Nepalese rupees somewhere. And like, I was really trying to burn through all of that. At, like, you exchange so much money and I go, that's the money I'm going to use for my entire vacation. And I normally overshoot and then I have to lay myself down with a load of merchandise and souvenirs that I'm just like, why the fuck did I take so much money? Because I just don't understand, you know, like you're like, that should be enough. The Lonely Planet Guide says that I should uh, be taking about this much for two weeks. And then you're like, holy shit, is this too much money? And I always, one time, when I went to Kathmandu, I had so much, too much money to the point, like, you know, and it's really hard to exchange it. Nothing exchanges it very often. Uh, it's a pain in the ass anyway. Uh, I'm going to try and get 20 at least. Or more. <laughs> I was hoping he would go wide a little bit so I could sneak around him. Fuck. Lost time now. Going wide. K. 
Gotcha, man. Yeah. Oh, no. No, you'd overtake me again. i got to do this for reals. Yeah. We've got second. It would be a stretch to try and get first, but yeah, no, we're not going to do it. Look at the gap. Look at that gap. It's better than last time, I think. I can't remember what I did last. Eh. What? Oh, because I already had third. Oh, it's robbed me. So yeah, now I have favorite strange soda, Mirinda, but they have Mirinda apple here as well, and it's bright nuclear green. So it's probably going to kill me. And also Mirinda orange. So yeah, I like doing that kind of stuff. My change. Just, you know, clear out the change part every now and then and actually use it. So yeah, let's do this one. No. <laughs> hey, did I do this only recently? I feel like I did this only recently. Panigale, yes. The $12.99. Oh. Yeah, I've got like a jam jars that I repurposed that are just filled with random currencies. And some of them go out of date. Like I have a pound that's like the old pound. And everyone's like, why the fuck do you still have this old style pound? I was like, I didn't realize you changed it in my absence and it's now worthless. So it's like, better off just using it when you can. I think I still even got some Vietnamese dong somewhere. And like I was saying, everywhere you go, you kind of overcompensate or you just don't understand the cost of things there because you've never been before. So you exchange too much money going on holiday somewhere. And then you're like, well, I'm going to have to. And like Nepal, I straight up had to buy another bag because I just went with an overnight bag anyway. So I didn't use my checked in luggage. And on the way back, I was just a checked in luggage and it was just a bag filled with fake cashmere's uh, salt tea, Buddhist books, uh, like by the Dalai Lama and stuff. Um, uh, salt, what else? Uh, coffees, like, uh, soaps, incense, fuck tons of incense and soap, and, uh, all sorts of little figurines and stuff, and I was just like, and it was a North Face bag as well. <laughs> and a load of beads and stuff that I still wear occasionally. Um, and necklaces and bracelets and whatnot. <laughs> and it was just like... <laughs> wasn't planning on doing that. And uh, it was just so cheap there. And I had so much ridiculously. And I was like, there's nothing else I want. And I spent two or three days of my ten day vacation. Just going around buying weird stuff and having fancy food, renting out motorbikes for the day and driving all over, maybe driving up a mountain. And just like, it was pretty chill. Didn't, I just used to get drunk at the hotel bar because the bars in Kathmandu weren't particularly great and very often weren't open and were like pumping club music 24 seven, but were in somebody's attic. It just felt really weird. So I was just like, nah feel like I'm going to get like harassed here because I was getting harassed in the streets by people who were like, hey man, just come down this alleyway. <laughs> and I was like, just get in this van. I don't see why you shouldn't get in the van. And you're like, I'm not getting in a van. <laughs> no no use. Uh, I'm sure you're nice, maybe. But uh, that happened a lot. Didn't get in the van. Uh, yeah, so, you know, and like, in some cases, you're paying in one currency and they're giving you change in another currency because they'll accept, I don't know, US dollars or Hong Kong dollars in Macau and then pay you back in Patakas. <laughs> it's like, well, now I have this useless currency because I'm never going back to Macau 
And if I do, I'm not going to be like, oh, better take my two Matakas I have. Matakas I have left. You know, so it's like there's a lot of that. Um, back to the metal conversation. A lot of people ask me how I went into metal, and it's a case of like, it's like a genre within a genre. A lot of people go, like, it's like there's layers to metal, it's like an onion. Metal is like onions. Uh, like, <clears throat> you, you are taking a plunge at every kind of level, and there's really like several levels to it, and like, it was really just a case of I grew bored with what I was listening to and felt like it just wasn't hard enough. Like, it wasn't like, you know, that feeling of it tearing you a new asshole. Just kind of disappearing, like, oh, this isn't heavy enough. It's not making me feel like, yeah, the whole time now. Like, it's still, I still enjoy Pantera and all this stuff. But, um... It wasn't uh, like it was heavy enough anymore, and I just started while studying, listening to the most brutal shit I could find on YouTube, just all the time. So I was like, oh, why not? And I, I was starting to listen. I did, I just picked them up based off of titles that I knew would be like. I got into this mentality of uh, I did this with punk much later as well, where I just wanted to get into the mentality of I want to listen to the most metal sounding death metal there is and I was just finding shit appearing at one point I saw the artwork for Carcass's Surgical Steel and I just bought the album off of the artwork like I did with uh, Mastodon's Crack the Sky and it was a sick album then I picked up Heartwork and that was a sick album and it's still one of my favourite albums of all time then I picked up Swan Song and I I enjoyed that too, it's got a lot of cool stuff on it, and then I was just like, yeah, I'll go listen to their older stuff, like, uh, Tools of the Tools of the Trade EP and stuff like that, um, or, like, earlier stuff, you know, like, uh, what was it, they were always called something weird, but the one with inca uh, Incarnated Solvent Abuse on it, and, like, stuff like that, and I was really enjoying that, I was like, yeah, I listen to Carcass, that's a pretty cool male sounding band name, um, Kind of went back to Arch Enemy after not, like, I saw Arch Enemy live in, like, 2009 or 2010 at one of these festivals, and it was around the time they released Chaos Legion's album. That was really sick, because I got to see the old lead singer. And, yeah, I was like, uh, yeah, this is pretty good. Uh, didn't really get around to listening to them again for a while, then I just bought Chaos Legion's album and, oh, the one with Nemesis on, and uh, the one with Nemesis and uh, My Apocalypse and stuff. Really sick album, and I was just like, this is cool. Because it's the same guitarist as the Carcass guitarist for a lot of that. Not all of it, like Surgical Steel is but like, artwork, it's the same. It's Michael, Michael Amott, Michael Amott, I don't know how to say anyone's name. And yeah, I just went, yeah, this is cool. And then at some point I just decided to have a psychotic break. I was doing something for somebody. They were asking me to design an app front end for them. So I just sat down and designed an entire app front end for what later turned out to be just something that they were kind of casually talking about and had no intention of actually completing. And I spent like three days on it and they were like, yeah, and they're like, oh, probably more like three weeks on it and the whole time I was just doing that with my headphones on because I didn't have a job at this point I was between jobs and I just designed an entire app front end for somebody for them to go yeah I don't think I'm gonna actually do that in the end my idea it turns out that the coding is pretty hard and there's more to it than that and you know man it's pretty difficult and I can't be bothered and uh <clears throat> I was like, great, because I made all of these pieces for you. And he was like, yeah, I'm sorry about that. But during that time, I was listening to Nile Black Seeds of Vengeance album. And then I was listening to Anon Nafrak and trying like crazy to enjoy Dying Fetus and Cerebral Ball because they were just coming up in the you may like this thing 
never really got on with either band, unfortunately. Had a chance to see Cerebral Bore live, kind of just didn't c click with them. That was at uh, Hammerfest, 2014 Hammerfest. I'd have to check the dates on that. And uh, yeah, it just didn't resound with me the way I wanted it to, but like, I mean, <clears throat> maybe it would now. Uh, yeah, around that time I started listening to a Vile, Paradise Lost, and Eamon Amar. Uh, they were pretty good, and still are, all of those. And then I saw Paradise Lost again after Hammerfest, and the Bride in the Insomnium, a band I'd already... I bought Across the Dark a while ago. I was like, they're pretty sick. And I saw them live with uh, Paradise Lost and Bride, and that was good. Didn't really like Vride when I first saw them, and then I kind of just got into them a little bit more. Started listening to King Diamond just out of fucking nowhere. I was like, oh yeah, I'll go listen to this. And it was just like, yeah, okay, that's pretty good. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, it was like, it's kind of like I just suddenly had a crazy moment and was just like, this isn't hard enough. I need harder. <laughs> and I was just like getting to this point where I was like, Picking songs that were clearly the dankest shit off of the titles, like, that's why I picked, I already picked up a skeletal domain, and then I just picked up Obituary Inked in Blood because it had a fucking butchered torso on the front, it was like, fucking sick, and just got obsessed with, like, gore shit, <laughs> it was just like, yeah, it's got gory and fucking violent as fuck, it's gonna scare people, I wanna offend and scare people now. I already had that, obviously, with Five Finger Death Punch. That caused, actually it caused a lot of arguments in my family. Because, uh, my, my dad liked the album and stuff, but it just, like, it, it got me very pissed off with a lot of stuff. Especially, like, just a lot of those songs resounded with me and made me just, like, really, like, pissed off with people and just made me feel like, oh, fuck you, you know what I mean? Uh, <clears throat> And it caused a lot of arguments where I normally would have backed down from my family because they're dickheads, but I used to just let them be dickheads. Uh, I was then just starting to be really aggressive back to them and just fighting them back and just being like, well, fuck you, and being really aggressive to them. And it kind of spurred that. That kind of like, I can't remember what else I was listening to. It was that and a few other bands that are similarly aggressive, Slipknot and uh, stuff like that. And it really just gave me like the kind of, and I started at some point listening to stuff like Adam Mafrak, and was just like, oh, this track sounds cheery, when humanity is cancer. And then uh, at some point more Fire Than Blood came across my uh, watch list on YouTube, and I was like, oh, okay, that's pretty sick. And then it was uh, the Vanitas album just fucking sounded with me more than any of them. Constellation of the Black Widow is pretty good, but Vanitas, that shit is just brutal. <laughs> and it's brutal in a way that I could understand it because there was enough clear-ish vocals amongst the screaming. You can't save me, so stop fucking trying. Stayed in my like playlist, and to this day I still love it because it's just such... And the riff! Fucking hell. Uh, when I was on Spotify around this time, stuff like Hell Yeah came into my, uh, much lighter, of course. Stuff like Hell Yeah, the Moth, the album with Moth to Flame on it, or Moth, uh, what the fuck was that called? Blood Brothers. I really liked that one, and then I followed the next album that came out, that was, uh, had, uh, Human on it. And then I think Vinnie Paul died soon after that, didn't he? So that was a bit sad. Um, um, also Hatebreed came across my, uh, suggested list because of the music I listened to on, uh, Spotify around that time, and I was listening to Destroy Everything, and then later, much later, I was listening to stuff like their other back catalogue. That was just in a lot of playlists for me, and then I was starting to listen to, only semi-recently, actually, did I go back and listen to more Hatebreed. And it's stuff like uh, 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 Ashes They Shall Reap. What's that called? Is that what it's called? Ashes They Shall Reap. Born to Bleed, Fight to Succeed, that one. And uh, what else of theirs was I listening to? Like, uh, 
lot of that stuff, a lot of that stuff, like, uh, as hot, Die Hard as they come, I really liked. And, yeah, saw them live twice, walked away the first time, my mates walked away the second time, and I was like, ah, oh, they played the songs I liked, and I stopped watching. Slayer came late into my life. A lot of people are like, oh, you gotta love Slayer. Someone gave me Rain in Blood, and I just obviously listened to Rain in Blood alongside all the other fresh metal, but I always at the time thought, this is too silly. It's too trying to be evil. Nah, it's, it's not serious, you know. Metallica is more serious, and I was in a weird space at that point where I was like, ah, all this Satanism's overdone, it's silly. And like all of this stuff, and then I was listening to Angel of Death and all that stuff. I was like, yeah, fucking awesome. And then, like, ironically, one of the songs I really liked of theirs was Disciple, where they're just screaming, God hurts us all! <laughs> I was just like, yes. I agree. <laughs> I went for a huge period of time where I thought I was being edgy by telling everyone that God isn't real and fuck your fucking God and all of this shit uh, around this time and I was just being a huge asshole about it and a World Painted Blood came out and I was just like, I'm just gonna listen to this. And then I got the World Painted Blood and the ACDC uh, pinball machines on my old Mac and I was just playing because they were really cheap or free, and then I was just like, yeah, and it caused a revival in ACDC within me, where I started really listening to and appreciating the Bon Scott era a lot more, because I've been, basically my whole life, it's been the Brian Johnson era, right? So I was very, I was always into Black in Black, that was just a staple. Ever since, like, I'd say college, beginning of college, I was just listening to ACDC's Back in Black album back to back again and again a um, lot of those albums I would just wear them out just again and again and again ZZ Top came late into my life and so did Slayer because yeah my family just never had those bands and it never resonated with them uh, Priest obviously was on that data disc I mentioned in the other part so I was listening to a lot of their stuff but Really, it was mostly I was listening to Painkiller and Screaming for Vengeance and British Steel, and then I started to get into that other stuff that's a little mellower and a little more rocky. And then I listened to some of their more obscure metal stuff, like uh, the one with Judas Rising and Deal with the Devil on. Uh, that was good. Uh, Killing Machine or Hellbent for Leather was very good. Uh, Defenders of the Faith. And like a lot of this stuff came quite late because it's like you have all of this music, suddenly you show an interest in music and you are drowning in music. Because if you've got a few mates and they're like, listen to this, now listen to this. Oh, hey, have you listened to Linkin Park Meteora? And you're just like, yeah, I'll get around to it at some point. But really you're just sitting there and you're just, you're like, you know, you know you're what, listening and listening and listening to the same album same three albums again and again, and you're just remembering every note, every transition, every vocal line, and you're just going, yeah, this is the fucking best. And then, like, someone's like, have you had time to listen to Hybrid Theory? And you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> and then I saw Linkin Park a few times live, and, like, that was around the time, was it A Thousand Suns came out? Saw them one time when um, New Divide had just come out, but the album prior to that, <coughs> uh, that one, you know, um, had loads of good tracks on it. Um, what I've done, you know, that was that. Uh, that was the lead single. It was one of the lead singles, and uh, I saw them then. And then when they did New Divide, and then the next time I saw them, they were doing A Thousand Suns. And then I think we were considering going to one where they had just done the new, new album with Castle of Glass. And then we didn't go, and then Chester passed away soon after that. So that was kind of sad. Uh... Yeah, um, uh, 
somehow Linkin Park were kind of always there, but they weren't ever like the heaviest thing in circ circulation for me. A lot of my mates were really into it, and I always read it as a bit like, this is a bit too like, you know, feels like, you know, I don't really, like, I respond, I think it shows a lot in my music, I respond to negative things with anger, and I'm very much like, fuck this, fuck you, fuck, very, I'm very Iowa Slipknot, <laughs> I'm very Iowa era Slipknot, and very third wave of the fist, five finger death punch, and a lot of my mates were always the kind who were a little more like... Linkin Park, Lost Prophets, Pop Punk, and Emo, kind of, you know, AFI, and that kind of stuff, you know, like My Chemical Romance and stuff, and we're like, I'm so sad, and I was just like, fuck everything, <laughs> like the whole time, so it's like, and I, I notice it's a lot to do with my personality as well, whereas like, a lot of people I know, they suffered from a lot of depression, and I do too, and during that time in your life, when you're like, teen to early 20s you are going to suffer from a lot of like stuff like that sometimes and uh the way you respond to it is really like how you get through life and I found out a lot of my friends just never managed to get past feeling depressed and feeling useless and I feel like it's not the music's fault but the music's are like a projection of who we are kind of thing like the stuff that they were identifying with was the stuff where they were like feeling sad, whereas my response was to smother that and replace it with, like, anger and, like, you don't get to tell me what to do kind of attitude. And, like, they were always, like, you know, they were very corn. A lot of my friends were really into corn and that kind of era where it was, like, um, uh, Alone I Break, that's the song. All Alone I Seem to Break. Uh, falling away from me, freak on a leash, that kind of stuff, you know, like, uh, they were very that, whereas I was like, I'm a weird, mad psychopath, and I'm gonna fucking kill you, and they were all like, I'm sad, I might cut myself later, and I don't want to be a dick, some of my mates were self-harming, and, like, uh, I think it's, like, I'm not trivializing this, this is a serious problem, uh, I think, like, the music didn't make them do it. I think the music was a cry for help. Or the music was a, this is what I relate to, and it says a lot about my mental state that this is what I relate to, and no one picked up the cries for help. And, you know, a lot of my mates were like that. Um, and I think, to some extent, they're still kind of like that. And just not really, like... You know, oh, Ramstein. Let's talk about something nice. Ramstein came across my uh, playlist in the weirdest way possible, but it was like someone showed me do Hast, and they weren't even into metal. They were just like, dude, Ramstein are fucking awesome. You need to listen to them. So I started listening to them. And then they released Lieber is for Aladar, and my mates were going nuts for it. They lent me the album, and I was like, yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. And then I picked up Mutter completely separately to this and was like, Ish, <laughs> to myself. And was like, it really re sparked my interest in learning German. And then I went on to start listening to other German bands like Ice Pressure. And the, the guy came from Megahertz before, didn't he? So I was listening to a lot of that stuff and Stallman and oh, Unheilig and bands like this. <clears throat> It became like a thing for me, and a lot of my mates just stuck to Ramstein because it was really a case of Ramstein were the only guys playing in the UK that were a German language band, really. So they were really into that. Oh, around the time in 2009 as well, we saw Pen I saw Pendulum Live um, at Download, and I was like, oh, look, Pendulum, that's fun. And we were watching Pendulum, and God, did they not age well? glad they split up to be honest because it's like they did not age well now not that they did anything weird or risque it's just it's very that era where everyone's like the new era is here mixing dubstep and electronic music with rock and pretending it's still heavy and they were getting the inflames guy up on stage and all of this shit 
and you're like, yeah, it's, it's not really like, it doesn't really fit, doesn't, you know, especially now when they've got electronic artists like Carpenter Brute and Perturbator around, and they're like much more dark and like edgy, and they're like got really gritty, like looking like album artwork and shit. It's just not the same, you know? <clears throat> I feel like they had an idea and that those people like Pendulum had an idea, but it was like Prodigy had that idea like years ago because Fat of the Land was a big album for me too. Everyone I knew in secondary school was playing Fat of the Land, even though it's still pretty old by that standard. Uh, and uh, they just kind of did it better, personally, I thought, obviously, because Prodigy. And then um, Pendulum came along and I was like, oh, okay, I see what they're trying to do. They kind of feel like, kind of like, more like Muse kind of level. I used to love Muse as well, actually. Uh, really liked the one Nights of Cydonia came on. Uh, Absolution as well, and the one that, was it Space Dementia came on? No. Origin of Symmetry was the one with Absolution on, and uh, Plug In Baby. And then there was uh, the one with the blue men on top, was that Absolution? Yeah, I think that was Absolution. Both of those are really sick albums. I really like the use. In that certain period of time, I really fucking loved Muse. And then again, it just was like Green Day, where I was like, really love this band. Then after the next album, didn't even pick up the new album. I was like, oh, well, I've moved on. I don't know why. All right. Um, I can do one more, but I don't think I'm going to get anything here. What's this one? Single race S category. I got bronze. Can we do better than bronze? Uh, I have the Super Ligera. <clears throat> uh, what was I going to say? Big bands for me back in those times. Uh, oh, System of a Down shouldn't go without a mention. I listened to Toxicity, and I just listened to Toxicity on repeat. Then someone decided that it would be a good idea for them to give me Hypnotize and Mesmerize. And then I got the uh, original self-titled album, Steal This Album. Didn't really like Steal This Album, but whatever. Like, it was alright, but it was just like... Really, like, the self-titled album and Toxicity really were big things for me. Uh, Hypnotize and Mesmerize, I came back to it much later, like, second year college. <coughs> And was just like, yeah, you know, and like, yeah, I got really into those. Uh, then saw them live, and you could tell that they were like really, they really hated each other. And couldn't, they weren't even keeping it together on stage, you know, like they were like, Serge was changing lyrics to like, uh, take the piss out of Darren, the, the Malakian guy, the guitarist. Uh, like, I, yeah, they, there's a lot of problems there. You can see by seeing them live and in a room for five seconds, they're getting paid millions just to be nice and to play the fucking so tracks and, like, download all well, the kind of people who managed to secure Rage Against the Machine around the era. I saw them live during this when they did that Finsbury Park play because um, people were, like trying to overthrow the X Factor Christmas single thing by all buying uh, Rage Against the Machine uh, at the same time, the single uh, Killing in the Name. And uh, <clears throat> they did a one-off show and then download were like, as you're reforming for this one-off show, we will pay you millions <laughs> to come and play another one-off show the same year at Art and I saw them live there. It was pretty sick. I think that was the year it was them and ACDC. But, like, what's weird about the t-shirt for that year is that it doesn't say ACDC because they refused to give merch rights or something. So instead it says Them Crooked Vultures were headlining, which is bullshit. <laughs> they were great, Them Crooked Vultures, but then ACDC came on and played the Black Ice I'd already seen Black Ice once, and I saw it again, and it was exactly the same. 
like they played exactly the same set and I was like, oh wow, they don't even deviate slightly. They're no Iron Maiden. They don't do that shit. Uh, that was sick though. And then I think it was Aerosmith on the third day. Which is pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, and like, it happened the next year where it was Soda instead of Rage Against the Machine. Uh, and it was very clear that it was like download organizers were like, we will give you an absurd number of money to come and play exclusively at download. And it was around that time that Solosphere was trying to compete with them and then ended up going under. And they were just trying to make a point of like, okay, we need to be better than Solosphere every year now. We have to pull some sick shit out of the box. And they were basically not going much shorter than just trying to find people who were straight up being retired for like three, four, five years and going, please reform for a one-off thing just for us. And they were getting like all sorts, man. They had Iron Maiden, Metallica. They had all of them. They had all of the big guys. Whereas a few years before, they'd grown into this kind of lazy thing of just, uh, Linkin Park, Lost Profits. Ooh, that didn't age well. Oh, Feeder are headlining, because fuck it. Oh, yeah, oh, Biffy Clyro, maybe. You know, oh, Slipknot again. Maybe Korn can headline this year, and we're just getting real, like, pulling guys who are normally, like, second up, and guys like Lost Prophets who shouldn't have been allowed on the fucking stage, considering what happened. Uh, but I always used to say Lost Prophets are, like, budget Linkin Park, because they don't have the hits that Linkin Park have, and they don't... They don't have the sales. They straight up don't have the sales, you know? <clears throat> All like the memorable songs and anthems to be up there and like, you know, you're thinking, Feeder? Really? And then I saw Feeder at Sonosphere 09 and they were like, mid of the middle of the day? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that seems more right for a metal show. And like, you know, I was sat there like, why didn't they ever get Foo Fighters or anything? It's weird. And uh, yeah, it just became this kind of thing of like, really, we're just doing the same kind of like bands again and again. And it was just a bit like, Sonosphere came on the scene and were like, we're going to bring you Iron Maiden and Ramstein and stuff like this. So we're going to bring you Linkin Park and what was the first one in 09? It was like Linkin Park and uh, another band. Was it Maiden? I don't think it was Maiden the first time. I think next year it was Bramstein and Maiden, so it could have been Maiden twice. Metallica, I think. And then it was like Lamb of God, Mastodon, The Sword, and Finn Lizzy were announced and then deconfirmed. Uh, like all sorts of bands, and everyone was going nuts. And it made, started to make a uh, download look like shit, and they had to start taking practices that uh, they hadn't taken before because Sonosphere reinvented the wheel a little bit. And they were like, oh, shit. Like, they started staggering stages and shit. And they started trying to do shit a little bit more organized. And, you know, it's, and then they were suddenly going, right, we're going to hire these people who are basically unhirable because they're so expensive. And we're going to get them. And they're just not, they're not even going to be headliners. They're going to be second stage headliners just as a power move That's, that shit was pretty sick and it injected that competitiveness and while it kind of meant that like Sonosphere was getting awards for their lineups but then weren't making enough money to be able to run every year it was making it to the point where like Download was having to actually use the massive profits it makes every year to hire ridiculous acts that would never play the UK or aren't allowed to play in the UK because they signed an exclusive deal, deal with Download so that they would only play Download that year in the UK. It's nuts. But anyway, uh, that was a weird time. High Voltage was good as well, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs>